when you look at anything in the occult, all you have to do is compare it to the Bible. You're going to find out just about everything in the occult was either reversed or perverted from the Holy Scriptures. In the end, you're going to find out that Lucifer has never had an original idea yet. movement is the modern day popularization of occultism which has been one of the main objectives of the Theosophical Society. In her book The Key to Theosophy, Blavatsky stated that one of the primary means of building a global brotherhood of man would be quote, to encourage the study of those laws least understood by modern people, the so-called occult sciences. The occult sciences, stated Blavatsky, help develop and cultivate quote, the hidden powers latent in man thus giving him tremendous advantages over more ignorant mortals. The occult sciences include magic, mediumship or channeling, hypnosis, alchemy, and astrology, all of which are very popular in the New Age. So you have multiple books in here on, on astrology, telepathy, and, and just various books on magic. The New Age Almanac notes the success of Blavatsky's endeavor to spread occultism in the West. Quote, Several hundred new occult organizations can be traced directly to the Theosophical Society. For example, drawing upon the esoteric work initiated by Theosophy, ritual magicians have attempted to attain the mastery of the world through occult means, in a measure only hinted at in Theosophical circles. Theosophy also nurtured a reborn astrology. Beginning with minuscule astrological groups in the late 19th century, astrology made an astounding comeback to become the most pervasive popular occult practice in the latter part of the 20th century. Like the New Age movement, the primary aim of occultism is the pursuit of the expansion or evolution of consciousness and the attainment of Christhood through spiritual initiation. Occultist Rudolf Steiner is a perfect example of this idea, as a collection of his lectures is entitled The Evolution of Consciousness as Revealed Through Initiation Knowledge. Aleister Crowley, arguably the most notorious occultist and Satanist of all time, is an even more profound example of the occult roots of the New Age. Author Nicholas Campion sums up Crowley's New Age lineage and his influence in the development of New Age thought. Quote, there were two important currents of New Age prophecy in the 20th century West until the 1950s. One was embedded in the Theosophical and Esoteric tradition, promoted by Alice Bailey, Rudolf Steiner, and Carl Jung. The other was magical, promoted by Aleister Crowley, and emphasized paganism and decadence. Crowley's vision of a new global religion, his understanding of all great prophets as manifestations of a single essence, and his desire to restore the West by teaching the East to the West mark him out as an heir to Blavatsky. Crowley's esotericism was by and large unoriginal. However, his most important contribution to New Age thought was to provide a statement of universal rights. Crowley's philosophy was fundamentally New Age. He propounded New Age ideas such as the following, quote, Happiness lies within oneself. Every man and every woman is a star, and the infinite unity is our refuge, since if our consciousness be in that unity, we shall care nothing for the friction of its component parts, and our light is the inmost point of illuminated consciousness. He believed that through meditation, quote, the consciousness of the many may be melted to that of the one, leading to the, quote, expansion of consciousness to that of the infinite which, as I previously cited, was exactly how Alice Bailey defined the New Age initiation process. This is a clear sign that occultism, Satanism, and the New Age movement are part of the same spiritual phenomenon. And I love what you said about the evolution of the next consciousness. What's evolving is, is consciousness. Consciousness is the thing that's evolving, and it expands in every way it can. We are also granted the gift of experiencing an expansion within our own consciousness. Through the expansion of consciousness. We are moving away from this separation consciousness and moving into unity, oneness consciousness. The solar flares, the, the vibrational frequency is actually awakening all of us, and we're awakening as one. Because you are connected in consciousness to everybody. We need to come together in mutual acknowledgement 
that we're all the same consciousness having different experiences. The change consciousness is about oneness, unity of everything. Alice Bailey made it very clear that occultism was the source for her view of the Christ, and she believed that this New Age occult Christ would soon overthrow the Jesus of traditional Christianity. Quote, it can be expected that the Orthodox Christian will at first reject the theories about the Christ which occultism presents. At the same time, the same Orthodox Christian will find it increasingly difficult to induce the intelligent masses of people to accept the impossible deity and the feeble Christ which historical Christianity has endorsed. Occultism presents a Christ who is present and living, who is known to those who follow him, who is a strong and able executive and not a sweet and sentimental sufferer, who has never left us but who has worked for 2,000 years through the medium of his disciples, the inspired men and women of all faiths, all religions, and all religious persuasions, who sees divinity in them all and who comprehends the techniques of the evolutionary development of the human consciousness. These ideas the intelligent public can and will accept. Then the picture of a Christ demanding a unique position to the exclusion of all other sons of God will fade out in the wonder of the true apostolic succession in which many sons of God on different rays of differing nationalities and with varying missions are to be seen historically leading humanity along the path of divine unfoldment and nearer to God the source. Occult or esoteric means that which is hidden or secret and refers to knowledge only known to the initiated. Occult teachings are usually associated with the idea of spiritual awakening, which is a very popular idea in the New Age. One becomes awakened when they have learned a hidden truth about the world and themselves, and thus they become initiated into the secrets or mysteries of the ages. We're moving into this new age of Aquarius, and it's going to be an awakening for everyone again. It's sort of an awakening that happens in consciousness. And I think that there is a more of an awakening. This great awakening is just about to take place. It is the awakening of the Christ principle in humanity. From expanding. I was, I was expanding in more of a positive <laughs> direction. Yeah. yeah. There has been an awakening. Mankind's first awakening, according to the occult, occurred in the Garden of Eden, when the serpent revealed a great mystery to Eve that God had kept hidden from her, that she could become like God if she partook of the Tree of Knowledge. This was the first initiation. By eating of the Tree of Knowledge, Eve was initiated into the mysteries. She discovered her true identity and became God. This has been the foundational teaching in the occult and mystery schools for centuries that in the Garden of Eden, the serpent was the arbiter of mankind's initiation into godhood and imparted the ageless wisdom. This is what Madame Blavatsky meant when she stated that Satan, the serpent of Genesis, is the real creator and benefactor, the father of spiritual mankind, and that Satan can only be regarded in the light of his savior. Aleister Crowley similarly stated, this serpent, Satan, is not the enemy of man, but he who made gods of our race, knowing good and evil. He bade know thyself and taught initiation. Alice Bailey also confirmed that the roots of initiation are found in the Garden of Eden and the serpent's temptation to eat of the tree of knowledge. Quote, initiation leads to the cave where the secret of good and evil is revealed. This explains how the ancient mysteries or ageless wisdom has retained the same core body of teachings through the centuries because they have descended from the same spiritual father, the serpent. This is why the mystery schools, which are the ancient ancestor religion of today's New Age movement, worship the serpent as the bringer of divine wisdom. In Isis Unveiled, Madame Blavatsky confirmed that the serpent was the supreme god of the mystery schools. Quote, the Hierophants, moreover, of Egypt as of Babylon, generally style themselves the sons of the serpent god, or sons of the dragon, because in the mysteries, the serpent was the symbol of wisdom and immortality. Manly P. Hall, a 33rd degree Freemason and one of the most well-known experts on ancient and esoteric wisdom, also confirms the Christ-like importance of the serpent in the mystery schools. Quote, the initiates of the mysteries were often referred to as serpents, and their wisdom was considered analogous to the divinely inspired power of the snake. Among nearly all these ancient peoples, the serpent was accepted as the symbol for wisdom or salvation. 
Notwithstanding statements to the contrary, the serpent is the symbol and prototype of the universal savior who redeems the world by giving creation the knowledge of itself and the realization of good and evil. The accepted theory that the serpent is evil cannot be substantiated. It is the symbol of the reincarnation which was common to many of the ancient mystery schools. What's interesting is that the Bible actually prophesies the rise of the mystery schools, which consist of the serpent's spiritual offspring or followers. As the Bible makes clear, the offspring of the serpent would be engaged in a long and hostile spiritual war with God's Son, the true Messiah sent to undo the damage done by the serpent in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 3, almost immediately after Adam and Eve's encounter with the serpent and their subsequent betrayal of God's command, God foretells the coming of the Messiah and the ensuing conflict that would arise between the Messiah and the serpent's offspring. Speaking to Satan, God says in Genesis 3.15, quote, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He, that is Jesus Christ, will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. This one verse explains centuries of spiritual war between the mystery schools and those who follow the God of the Bible. And it also implies that these are really the only two types of people in the world, those who follow the God of the Bible and those who follow the serpent. It also makes perfect sense of why occultists like Alice Bailey, being the offspring of the serpent, consistently take issue with the Jesus Christ of the New Testament, and why the mystery schools and Christians have for so long battled over who the true Savior is. Also, Satan, in an obvious attempt to discredit the true Jesus Christ and lead people away from true salvation, has created his own occult or Aquarian Jesus, who has supposedly been suppressed by Bible-believing fundamentalist Christians. This is Spiritual Warfare 101, and it is this occult Christ whom Alice Bailey and the Lucius Trust claim is soon returning. According to the Bible, Adam and Eve's partaking of the Tree of Knowledge was a disastrous event that led to mankind's fall into sin and separation from God. Yet the occult New Age, interpreting the event from the other side, claims Adam and Eve's encounter with the serpent was a revolution in mankind's development toward higher consciousness. Rather than living in paradise as the Bible claims, Adam and Eve were imprisoned by Jehovah, spiritually unconscious, stuck living a mere animal existence, and the serpent came to liberate them with the gift of divine consciousness. The teaching of the serpent as the great initiator and savior of mankind is currently gaining worldwide acceptance through the New Age movement, which ultimately aims to precipitate the next Garden of Eden event by helping humanity ascend the ladder of spiritual evolution and unlocking the next level of consciousness. As the modern-day incarnation of the ancient mystery schools, the New Age movement worships the serpent both literally and symbolically. Perhaps the most blatant manifestation of this serpent worship is through what is known as the Kundalini, or serpent energy, the latent divine power believed to be lying dormant within each person. In the glossary to her theosophical devotional called The Voice of the Silence, Blavatsky defined the Kundalini as, quote, serpentine or the annular power on account of its spiral-like working or progress in the body of the ascetic developing the power in himself. It is an electric, fiery, occult, or phohatic power, the great pristine force, which underlies all organic and inorganic matter. According to the New Age, the Kundalini, which Alice Bailey defined as the fire at the base of the spine, can be awakened through practices like yoga and meditation. And once it is aroused, the Kundalini then activates seven focal points of energy in the body, called chakras, as it is raised up a person's spine. Alice Bailey taught that the awakening of the Kundalini energy is a critical part of the New Age initiation process. In a treatise on white magic, she stated that when the Kundalini energy is aroused, it, quote, correctly makes possible the final initiations into the consciousness of the monad, or God. The Kundalini concept is essentially an occult metaphorical twist on the Garden of Eden account, with the notion of the serpent bringing the gift of God consciousness or divine wisdom. Professor John White, who has extensively researched the occult sciences of meditation and higher human development, comments on the Kundalini and its correlation with achieving godhood. Quote, Nearly all the world's major religions, spiritual paths, and genuine occult traditions see something akin to the Kundalini experience as having significance in divinizing a person. 
The word itself may not appear in the traditions, but the concept is there nevertheless, wearing a different name, yet recognizable as a key to attaining godlike stature. The Kundalini and seven chakra centers have been a central part of the mystery school teachings since ancient times. One Hindu esoteric author confirms this, quote, The ancient symbol of serpent in all the ancient mystery schools of the world is a codified secret symbol of the human vital energy flow channels, represented in the physical body by the spinal cord, through which the vital life force, prana, in the form of a snake motion, moves in the chakras, vortex of energies. New Age author Daniel E. Mitchell claims the same. Quote, there were seven levels of these mystery schools that taught Arat Sekum, which means the serpent power. It was about connecting with the seven energy points of the holy serpent fire of God within them, while traveling upon the mystical path that leads to the awakening of the Christ consciousness. Describing what occurs when the Kundalini is awakened, New Age author Cindy Dale states, Our full physical and spiritual selves begin to merge. In Samadhi, all aspects of our true being, now fully activated by the Kundalini, can achieve a state of union with the Divine and empower us to become our real selves. Commenting on the rise in popularity of the Kundalini in America and the influence of Eastern spiritual teacher Gopi Krishna, Christian author John Newport writes, Gopi Krishna devoted much of his life to learning everything he could about Kundalini. He considered it the most jealously guarded secret in history and the guardian of human evolution. He believed it to be the driving force behind genius and inspiration. Gopi Krishna was eager to see Kundalini awakening cultivated, especially in the West. Since the 1970s, Kundalini awakenings have been reported with an increasing frequency in the West. the arousal of this power, a stream of silvery energy rushes up the spine and reaches the brain. Kundalini is a, a very powerful energy. And when it begins to wake up, it's almost like this force that's trying to rise up our spine. I started experiencing energetic flows inside my body, uh, going up my spine during that meditation. And it it clears the chakras as it moves up. I can actually feel it moving in my body. The Kundalini serpent, the energy oh. that can rise up to your animal energy can become the coronated serpent. In fact, the brain is now fed with, with, with a more powerful energy than before. It felt like my entire brain just lit up, like a current shot up my back into my brain. Which causes it to become luminous. This gray, white, luminous energy. It expands my consciousness. And expanded my consciousness. And, you know, I had experience of huge, expanded, like, cosmic consciousness. An expansion within our own consciousness. Which we can conquer through the expansion of consciousness. So it's like my senses had expanded it was weird. I, I felt connected to everything. It was like I was face to face with that. Ever take you to a crazy place? Like yeah. Psychedelic state? Yeah, I had that realization that what I considered to be myself was a construction and it wasn't real. That like my memories and my perception and my desires are just a conglomeration of biochemical impulses that, pure, that I'm merely a conduit of pure consciousness. This experience of God our cosmic consciousness is actually an experience of a higher form of consciousness towards which mankind is evolving at present. Just as man climbed from the state of an animal to that of a man, he has to take another leap to reach a higher dimension of consciousness where he can perceive the creative energies of the universe. 33rd degree Freemason Manly P. Hall explains the occult significance of the Kundalini serpent, quote, that sleeping serpent power in man, which coiled head downward around the tree of life, drove him from the garden of the Lord and became the symbol of the Christ. 
The Pharaoh was an initiate of Scorpio, and the Serpent is the transmuted Scorpio energy, which, working upward in the regenerated individual, is called the Kundalini. This serpent was the sign of initiation. It meant that within him the serpent had been raised, for the true pharaoh was a priest of God as well as a master of men. Hall also correlated the kundalini serpent with the Garden of Eden. Quote, the tree that grows in the midst of the garden is the spinal fire or kundalini energy. The knowledge of the use of that spinal fire is the gift of the great serpent. Knowing this, it should be no surprise that Satanists take a liking to the concept of the kundalini. On an openly satanic website, it states, The serpent or snake, which symbolizes Satan, represents the kundalini at the base of the spine, also the DNA. The serpent represents life. When this force is activated, we are healed and enlightened. Satanist Aleister Crowley also believed in the power of the kundalini energy. He spoke of, quote, the serpent flame, and encouraged everyone to, quote, arouse the coiled splendor within you. Along these lines, some reports of what people undergo during a kundalini awakening share a very eerie similarity with accounts of individuals who have experienced demonic possession. Also, I've noticed that my body has started to jerk around unexpectedly. And when it first moved, it was so intense that, uh, you know, I had convulsions, seizures, incredible neurological disorders, uh, loss of memory, couldn't sleep. It was a really crazy experience. And, you know, it's funny because, like, when it was happening with me, people would see me and, you know, my body would be shaking or trembling. And, I mean, I was experiencing absolute bliss, but when, you know, friends and family or whatever, I'd go, I even went and saw doctors and neurologists, all kinds of stuff. People would look at me and they'd turn pale because they were like, oh my God, there's something really wrong with this guy, you know, and nobody could figure it out. I knew what it was all along. But the Kundalini force in general can be quite powerful and create an intense havoc for us. Um, you know, some people get stuck like this or you know, their eyes roll back in their head. And, and that's helpful for a lot of people to, you know, kind of wake up the divine energy within us, open our channels and, and help those energies to move. But Kundalini energy is just an amazing force. I found yoga to be extremely helpful and some forms of yoga were helpful. You just have to be completely dedicated to the Kundalini practice. You, know, and you have to go to a, a very specific state that's achievable once mm -hmm. you, you have some mastery over the, the, the meditation and the, the, the yoga principles. Doing Kundalini yoga oftentimes is a very good way to balance your chakras, balance your energy body, so you can stay as grounded as one can in the midst of their awakening. Teachings on yoga. See multiple books here on yoga. Ani Yoga. There's another one. Yogi Philosophy. Yoga in any way, shape, or form has the ability to corrupt the mind and undo a Christian's faith. It has as its goal the conversion of the individual into the occult. Yoga is from the Sanskrit word yug, meaning union with the divine or your higher self or your God self. Again, it's always about attaining Godhood. I will be like the Most High. I will ascend under the sides of the North, just like Satan did. And this is, this is the, evidently the temptation for man. Consider the following portion from an article from a secular newspaper. It is estimated that there are 10,000 yoga teachers in the United States who teach between 4 and 5 million students a week. Man, that's a lot of people they're reaching. Kundalini awakening is typically believed to be inseparable from the practice of yoga, which also has occult and mystical roots. In his book, Yoga Sutras, the textbook of yoga psychology, Eastern spiritual guru Ramamurti Mishra states, In conclusion, it may be said that behind every psychic investigation, behind mysticism, occultism, etc., knowingly or unknowingly, the yoga system is present. Authors John Ankerberg and John Weldon state in the Encyclopedia of New Age Beliefs, quote, even yoga authorities have said that all yoga is ultimately kundalini yoga and that yoga is meaningless without it. This is why no less an authority than Hans Riker concludes, kundalini is the mainstay of all yoga practices. Even Bailey and Blavatsky affirm that yoga and kundalini awakening went hand in hand. 
Alice Bailey stated that Kundalini is, quote, a power known only to those who practice concentration in yoga and is centered within the spine. And Blavatsky considered yoga philosophy to be one of the occult sciences and referred to the Kundalini as, quote, one of the mystic yogi powers. The testimonies of virtually every yoga teacher destroy the false notion typically held by many in the West that yoga can be done purely for bodily exercise. Not only are the vast majority of yoga instructors well educated in the mystical components of yoga and are often devoted followers of those mystical teachings, but yoga classes typically involve many references to occult and pagan concepts and require that their students participate in them. Identifying the spiritual components and intentions underlying the yoga practice, yoga teacher Lorne Walker states, quote, The magic of yoga is the ability to transform not only your body, but also your mind and, by extension, your spirit. Although calming and stabilizing the breath is one big reason yoga has this effect on us, the specific intention behind the movements is what really makes yoga transformative. Many cultures, including Native American, Islamic, and ancient Sumerian cultures, have used movements very similar to some of the yoga movements for prayer, healing, and, we can only assume, physical well-being. There are hieroglyphs depicting some of the oldest physical movements performed by humans that look very similar to yoga poses. The movements can transform us on every level. According to Hindu tradition, man can achieve salvation and ascension through the mastery of yoga. William Kwan Judge, one of the co-founders of the Theosophical Society, claimed that yoga was one of the primary methods of unleashing the all-powerful God force and awakening our higher self. He stated in Practical Occultism, quote, The true practice of yoga begins by purifying the heart. Its perfection is not attainable until the personal idea is completely uprooted. You have in you the self all-powerful and omniscient. It cannot act because the lower self hinders it. The hindrances must be got rid of. The way to do it is in Patanjali's yoga and Bhagavad Gita. Esoteric researcher Mark Pinkham, author of the book The Return of the Serpents of Wisdom, claims that the first teachers of yoga were ascended beings called Kumaras. In the Theosophical Glossary, Madame Blavatsky defined the Kumaras as, quote, the seven sons of Brahma, born out of the limbs of the god in the so-called ninth creation. It is stated that the name was given to them owing to their formal refusal to procreate their species, and so they remained yogis, as the legend says. In The Secret Doctrine, Blavatsky elaborated further on the Kumaras, revealing that they are one and the same with the fallen angels of the Bible. Quote, of all the seven great divisions of Dian Koans or Devas, there is none with which humanity is more concerned than with the Kumaras. Imprudent are the Christian theologians who have degraded them into fallen angels, and now call them Satan and demons. The implications of this are obvious and serious. Mankind learned yoga from the fallen angels. So the serpent shows up in Genesis 3. It shows up very early, very, very early in God's relationship with mankind. And if you'll notice when it shows up, it shows up in the context of wisdom. And that, uh, that theme has followed throughout culture and history. All over this world, uh, cultures have equated the serpent with wisdom. The wisdom of the world and the wisdom we're talking about here with satanic wisdom or serpent wisdom is the wisdom that can be gained or understood by initiation. If you remember last week, I told you how that when you get into Kundalini Yoga, this serpent that lies at the base of the spine that wraps itself around your spine and protrudes its head across the top of your head. Once you've reached that state of illumination or enlightenment through the seven chakras or power points throughout your body and each one of these chakras or places of power or illumination is reached by the initiate through a system of meditation, study, learning, enlightenment. Once you go through these seven successive stages and find and end up with the one at the top, then you have reached the place of what's called an avatar or one who is a, who is a guru or a teacher of others. And you are at that point ready to ascend. And this is what they call the Lord Jesus Christ. They call him an ascended master.
Esoteric researcher Mark Pinkham contends that today we are experiencing a worldwide rebirth of the cult of the serpent that will soon culminate in the return of ascended beings from heaven and the establishment of a global New Age utopia, when we clearly see the serpent teachings of yoga and kundalini awakening rapidly spreading all around us, it is difficult to dismiss Pinkham's claims. We are indeed experiencing a global initiation into the religion of the serpent, the worldwide institution of the mystery religions, as prophesied in the book of Revelation, which speaks of the rise of mystery Babylon in the final days before the second coming of Christ. Through the New Age movement, the serpent is increasingly being understood as a symbol of enlightenment and wisdom, as the path to godhood. It is truly a global reenactment of the Garden of Eden, and it is all connected to Blavatsky's proclamation that the serpent of Genesis is the true spiritual liberator of mankind. And this is why what is occurring today with the Lucius Trust in the United Nations is a clear fulfillment of Bible prophecy about the end times and the coming of the Antichrist. We are confronted throughout history with certain symbols. One of them is the serpent, which was always much in evidence wherever the ancient temples devoted to wisdom flourished. Since the old story of Adam and Eve, the serpent has represented two things, knowledge and sex. And the secret is that the creative force within us is one single force. But as man aspires to higher ideals, as he yearns to create mentally and live in the spirit, the force is gradually drawn upwards to the creative principles in the brain. This force is called by the Easterns the Kundalini and is likened to a serpent of fire lying coiled at the base of the spine. The man is then filled with the inspiration and becomes attuned to the inner world of wisdom. He can then deliberately wield and mold with his mind creative patterns which will help to shape the future. He is no longer confined to the haphazard creative efforts of the average man. He can create from the inside with the invisible sources of all things. This can only be accomplished with the help of the Kundalini Serpent. Men and women have therefore the choice as to what they will do with this power within them. Man is a god in the making, and the goal is waiting before him. I've received a vision of light. Now you have to understand they have this in common, this vision of light. There is the beginning of a glimmer of a new light. The world is steadily filling with light. For centuries, Lucifer has been recognized as mankind's intellectual and spiritual savior by the various branches of the mystery schools. The New Age claims that Lucifer, as the angel of light or light bearer, is not an evil being, despite the claims of Christians. Yet the Bible tells us very clearly that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light in order to deceive and lead mankind astray. Deceived by Satan's disguise as a result of their own spiritual blindness, the New Age honors Lucifer as the great angel of light. Blavatsky, for example, equated Lucifer with a spotlight or beacon, stating in the secret doctrine, quote, Thus Lucifer, the spirit of intellectual enlightenment and freedom of thought, is metaphorically the guiding beacon which helps man to find his way through the rocks and sandbanks of life. So devoted was Blavatsky to the worship of Lucifer that she decided to name the Theosophical Society's journal after him. Commenting on the purpose behind the name of the magazine, International President of Lucius Trust, Sarah McKechnie, states, quote, In 1887, the magazine of the Theosophical Society took Lucifer as its name in an effort to bring clarity to what it regarded as an unfairly maligned, sacrificing angel. Alice Bailey displayed her love of Lucifer by naming her publishing company Lucifer Publishing, which is today's Lucius Trust. 
writing on the esoteric meaning of Lucifer, Lucius Strauss states on their website that Bailey and Blavatsky, quote, sought to elicit a deeper understanding of the sacrifice made by Lucifer. Lucifer is essentially the occult or New Age Christ, who, like Jesus Christ, is often hailed as the Savior or Messiah, who sacrificed himself for mankind. Throughout the Bible, Jesus Christ is referred to by many different nicknames or monikers, such as Savior, Redeemer, and Liberator, as Christ set man free from the law of sin and death, as Paul says in the 8th chapter of Romans. Blavatsky referred to Lucifer in this exact fashion by calling him the, quote, Redeemer, our intelligent liberator and savior from pure animalism. Lucifer as a messianic figure is found all throughout occult and New Age literature, and the New Age interprets Lucifer's fall not as a rightful expulsion from heaven by a holy god, but as a willing sacrifice on the behalf of humanity. The reason for Lucifer's fall or sacrifice according to the New Age and mystery schools was to help us evolve from mere animals into true human beings, possessing the powers of wisdom and consciousness. In this way, Bailey referred to Lucifer as the ruler of human self-consciousness in the externalization of the hierarchy. And this is one of the main reasons why consciousness is such an obsessively used term within the New Age, because Lucifer, as the god of the New Age and mystery schools, was the one who gave us the ability to be conscious or aware of our own existence and surroundings, something which the god of the Bible supposedly denied us. Just like the serpent of Genesis, Lucifer is believed to have imparted to mankind the wisdom of the gods, thereby initiating us into the secrets or mysteries of the ages definitively proving that it is not just Christians, but occultists as well, who perceive Lucifer and the serpent of Genesis as one and the same being. For example, occultist Rudolf Steiner identified Lucifer as the founder of the mysteries or ageless wisdom. Quote, Through Lucifer, human beings have acquired the faculty of using the organs of their intellect, of their power of intellectual discernment, namely the content of the mysteries. As we discussed in the previous section, the serpent has been worshipped by the mystery schools as the great initiator who taught mankind the mysteries of divinity. Aleister Crowley proclaimed that Satan or the serpent made gods of our race and taught initiation. Manly P. Hall stated the initiates of the mysteries were often referred to as serpents. And Helena Blavatsky stated that in the mysteries, the serpent was the symbol of wisdom and immortality. Blavatsky more blatantly identified Lucifer and Satan as one and the same entity in the secret doctrine. Quote, Satan, the enemy of God, is in reality the highest divine spirit. In this case, it is but natural to view Satan, the serpent of Genesis, as the real creator and benefactor, the father of spiritual mankind. For it is he who was the harbinger of light, bright radiant Lucifer, who opened the eyes of the automaton created by Jehovah. And he who was the first to whisper, In the days ye eat thereof, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Satan can only be regarded in the light of a savior. An adversary to Jehovah, he still remains an esoteric truth, the ever-loving messenger, the angel, the seraphim and cherubim, who both knew well and loved still more, and who conferred on us spiritual instead of physical immortality. Thus, contrary to Theosophist's claims that Christians mistakenly conflate Lucifer and Satan and falsely accuse Bailey and Blavatsky of satanic worship, it is clear from their own writings that occultists recognize Lucifer and Satan, or the serpent, as the bringers of wisdom and intellect, the ones who spiritually awakened man from his animalistic slumber and initiated him into the mysteries. Along with Lucifer, the New Age honors the entire host of fallen angels as benefactors of mankind who helped us evolve out of our animal state. Like the Garden of Eden account, the fall of the angels is an important event in both biblical and occult literature. It is simply once again a matter of perspective, where the Bible reports a group of sinful and rebellious angels disobeying a holy and righteous God. The occult or New Age reports a group of benevolent, selfless beings who wanted nothing but the best for mankind. In his book, False Dawn, Christian author Lee Penn summarizes the New Age interpretation of the fallen angels. Quote, Therefore, the revolt of the angels against God was part of the divine plan of evolution. Bailey says that at the inception of the divine plan, there took place the original war in the heavens, when the sons of God, who responded to the divine urge to experience, to serve, and to sacrifice, separated themselves from the sons of God, who responded to no such inspiration, but who chose to stay in their original and high state of being. In other words, the rebel angels were really the good guys. According to Lucius Trust, Christians have greatly misunderstood the fallen angels and have wrongfully vilified them as evil entities. 
Blavatsky confirmed the importance of the fallen angels in the evolution of man. Quote, Satan and his rebellious host would thus prove to become the direct saviors and creators of divine man. In an article entitled Descent and Sacrifice, published in a 1989 edition of the Beacon magazine, the name of which is a reference to Lucifer, International President of Lucius Trust, Sarah McKechnie, further articulates the occult or New Age view of the fallen angels. Quote, The mystery of the descent or fall to earth of the rebellious angels, the solar angels or Agni Shavatas, is said to be the mystery hinted at in the scriptures and the secret of the ages. The secret of the fallen angels is essentially the mystery which lies behind the very plan of evolution for the solar angels willingness to fall to sacrifice themselves in order to bring the light of the principle of mind to what was then animal man this act of sacrifice at the dawn of human history is a thread woven throughout the great scriptures and mythologies of the world now the reference to lucifer comes from Blavatsky's um, description of Lucifer in the accurate sense of the term, which is a Latin of Latin origin, it means literally light bearer. So Lucifer to Blavatsky was one of the great sacrificial beings who descended to earth. That's where we get the idea of the fall of the angels. That was the descent of the solar angels to earth as an act of sacrifice on our behalf. And it refers to a very obscure principle in the ageless wisdom, which is that the solar angels, the, the governing lords of the world, descended to our planet eons ago, bringing the principle of mind to what was then in those ancient, ancient times, essentially animal man, human beings with no mentality at all, no soul, just virtually living the existence of an animal. And these solar angels brought the principle of mind. That's the connection with Lucifer, light bearer, bringing the light of mind to our world. The idea that Lucifer awakened man's consciousness and can still awaken us to further levels of consciousness is widespread in the New Age. New Age author and authority David Spengler, who has been actively involved with the Finhorn Foundation, another New Age organization that has active ties to the United Nations, discovered the New Age through the writings of Alice Bailey and claims to have worked clairvoyantly with the spirit realm for decades. Writing on the approaching Luciferian initiation into the New Age of Aquarius and Lucifer's central role in this process, Spengler states in Reflections on the Christ, quote, Lucifer prepares man in all ways for the experience of Christhood. He is aptly named the Morning Star because it is his light that heralds for man the dawn of a greater consciousness. The true light of this great being can only be recognized when one's own eyes can see with the light of the Christ, the light of the inner sun. Lucifer works within each of us to bring us to wholeness, and as we move into a new age, which is the age of man's wholeness, each of us in some way is brought to that point, which I term the Luciferic initiation, the particular doorway through which the individual must pass if he is to come fully into the presence of his light and his wholeness. Lucifer comes to give us the final gift of wholeness. If we accept it, then he is free and we are free. This is the Luciferic initiation. It is one that many people now and in the days ahead will be facing, for it is an initiation into the new age. It is an initiation of leaving the past and moving into the new and becoming whole and at peace because we have recognized our inner light and the light that enfolds us, the light of God. When I began work with my non-physical mentor, who I called John, back in 1965, and he basically said our work was for a deeper collaboration between the non-physical and the physical worlds. Uh, from John's point of view, it meant that we needed a new vision of, of the incarnate self and not have a, a perspective that diminished it in relationship to spirit or the transcendental. Given what the world is entering into and the kind of global challenges we're facing, we need to. But to be able to stand in the presence of such an entity and say, we are equal. We are both sacred beings. And because I know my 
my sovereignty, my sacredness, my value in the, in the life of the world, we can be part of, part of the gift we bring. And out of that gift comes our ability to synthesize both worlds, to bring them into a new wholeness, to create alchemically what I like to think of as the new human, or the guy in the human, which I feel is critically needed in, in our time. If we really appreciate this nascent and developing spirituality, we want it to be a gift to our world. And within each of us is this radiant, this generative presence that we can gift to our world. The objective is to get back, reunite, achieve a consciousness of unity again, and so on. Whatever God is, it is within me, I am part of that. Jose Aragon, a follower of Gnosticism, a branch of the mystery schools of which we will get into greater detail in our discussion of extraterrestrials, falls in line with the general New Age belief that Lucifer woke man up into an enlightened state of consciousness. He claims that the information in his book, Primordial Gnosis, The Forbidden Religion, was communicated to him through various dreams, during which he was under instruction by a spiritual master who called himself Lucifer. Aragon was compelled by the entity to state the following, quote, According to Gnostic legends and myths, the great unknowable God sent Lucifer, angel of indescribable fire and light, to show man the light and to help him wake up and see his true origin, the origin of his spirit, which has been perversely imprisoned in this impure matter called body-soul. He is an uncreated being who came to the created world to bring light, liberating Gnosis, the saving knowledge which can wake man up and help him free his imprisoned spirit the knowledge which allows him to know who he truly is, why he is here in this world, and what he has to do to liberate himself and fulfill his spirit, which belongs to another uncreated and unknowable plane. Richard Levitin is another New Age author who speaks highly of Lucifer. Levitin argues that the story of Lucifer and his fall has existed in some form in almost every religious culture throughout history, the same basic story told over and over again with only superficial variations. In his book, The Emerald Modem, he says of Lucifer, quote, Lucifer is a great and mighty planetary consciousness who bears the light of wisdom. He is the angel of man's evolution, of man's inner light, of experience, and of light in the microcosmic world within the human. Believing that the Bible misrepresents Lucifer, Levitin claims that, quote, Judeo-Christian culture has blinded us to the true nature of this high celestial being. He then summarizes his New Age interpretation of the Garden of Eden. Quote, Later myths confused the dragon that guards the golden apples of wisdom with Lucifer, transforming him into a beguiling serpent. The golden apple part is correct. They embody higher divine knowledge, the fruits of spiritual attainment. Knowledge of the scope and implications of the choice for good and evil came of a golden apple, but it was not a deceiving serpent who offered us the opportunity. It was a free being offering freedom. Lucifer descended into our midst of his free will and to his own sacrifice. He can only rise out of our darkness when we are ready and able to rise with him. Lucifer is the high celestial redeemer being who fell solely on our behalf, and he awaits our recognition and reaffirmation to reverse his fortunes. Lucifer's identity as the self-sacrificing angel is important in making the connection between Lucifer and the New Age understanding of the Christ in his return. Not only is Lucifer consistently featured as a central figure within the New Age, but he is specifically recognized for his self-sacrifice for the benefit of man's evolution toward higher consciousness. The act of self-sacrifice for the sake of mankind is exactly what Christians honor and praise Jesus Christ for. But within the New Age, it is Lucifer, instead of Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself for mankind. Therefore, Lucifer is to the New Age what Jesus Christ is to Christianity. For just as Christians recognize Jesus of Nazareth as the one and only Christ who sacrificed himself so that humanity may be cleansed of sin and attain eternal life, so the New Age has its own occult Christ or Antichrist, Lucifer, who sacrificed himself so that humanity may attain God consciousness. This is why Manly P. Hall stated that in the mystery schools, the serpent, quote, became the symbol of the Christ and that, quote, the serpent is the symbol and prototype of the universal savior who redeems the world. And Blavatsky made a more subtle, yet very obvious reference to Lucifer as the Christ. 
In the first chapter of his gospel, the Apostle John refers to Jesus as the Word. Quote, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Greek, the Word is translated Logos. Blavatsky hijacked this title the Bible uses specifically for Jesus and applied it to Lucifer, stating in the secret doctrine, quote, Lucifer is the Logos in his highest. It is clear who the Christ is from the New Age perspective, and that it is not the Jesus Christ of the New Testament, whom the New Age consistently denies ever died on the cross or sacrificed himself for mankind. Lucifer, in his desire to be like the Most High God, has made himself out to be the Christ of the Mystery Schools and the New Age of Aquarius, thus perfectly setting the stage for his arrival as the Biblical Antichrist. So Lucifer to Blavatsky was one of the great sacrificial beings who descended to earth as an act of sacrifice on our behalf. He is the real savior of mankind. Lucifer is the real messiah. Ultimately, the purpose is to precipitate greater states of awareness as to our true identity. You realize that you are a copy of a fair part of the cosmos, and you know if you go all the way, of course, you go to the place where mystics have always said, you, you realize you're a, 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 like a little version of God. And you're saying exactly what I, I often say on, on Gnostic warriors, that we're each on our own path, and we each have to perfect ourselves and work on our faults and, and go towards the light. What you just said typifies what I would call Aquarian spirituality, Age of Aquarius. You have to postulate that human consciousness evolves over time, but it can only work at the rate at which the people can assimilate the light. It is exciting to have your consciousness expanded and, and part of what happens when the doors open is you start to remember. Deep recall your soul lineage, who, who were you in previous lives? The Supreme Being hopes that we see the, the error of those ways and reform ourselves on our own, not out of any religious compulsion, but just out of inherent wisdom, um, or you know the, the wisdom gained from Gnosis. We all have the same equipment. We all have the chakras, especially the high-end one, the sixth and the seventh, but they do require a little bit of training. So meditation protocols are always helpful, it's like just basic say Buddhist meditation and along with that some kind of rigorous training and purgation of the chakras in the context of gaining the use of the sixth and the seventh chakra in a condition of, of genuine clairvoyance and that's where you get all your answers that's where you get your gnosis that's where you get clear direction it's all within ourselves that's where you can become a contributing player in the large projects of the great white brotherhood and other efforts the goal being to create gold out of lead or in practical terms to create the light body in which the trillion cells of the body all turn spontaneously into light. The five stages in initiation, and you could also correlate them with the stages of alchemy, had been secret, veiled, and part of the mysteries to point the way to human consciousness. Lucifer is known as the Lord of Light, the Light Bringer, the Light Bearer. Lucifer was commissioned by the Supreme Being. Uh, to supervise the project of freedom in consciousness in humanity placed on the earth. Consciousness is all possibility. There's no limitation in space when you go into thought consciousness. You just experience pure consciousness. But it was the consciousness of Moses. It was the consciousness of Buddha. It was the consciousness of Jesus. That is the experience of consciousness. Your consciousness at the very depth of yourself. It's a consciousness awakening that's happening in each person. The evolution of the next consciousness. The evolution of consciousness in man, this is the next step. It expands my consciousness. Expanded my consciousness. A huge expanded like cosmic consciousness. An expansion within our own consciousness. Through the expansion of consciousness. We're all shifting our consciousness together. We are moving into unity. Oneness consciousness. Make it powerful in our consciousness that humanity is one. Because you are connected in consciousness to everybody. Consciousness is about oneness, unity of everything. Achieve a consciousness of unity again. 
if you find out who Lucifer is in various uh, mythic pictures from, from different cultures, like in, in Aztec you have Quetzalcoatl, in Greek myth you have Prometheus. They represent the perfection of free will, consciousness, beauty, the power of consciousness, the range of consciousness in a context of perfected human form. I mean, that's what the light bearer means. Lucifer's not a bad guy. So the demonization of the light bringer is a prime factor in anything to do with progress with the earth. If you want to save the earth, you have to redeem Lucifer. Who brought man the gift of fire? Prometheus. Who was Prometheus? Lucifer, what was the gift of fire? Knowledge, intellect. Through the use of intellect, man will conquer the earth, will conquer nature, and will himself become God. Lucifer is also commonly known within the occult by his Greek identity, Prometheus, the bringer of fire, which represents divine intellect or consciousness. This is why Prometheus and his flame is such a popular image within the occult, and it finds a direct correlation with the serpent, the Garden of Eden, and the Tree of Knowledge. In Isis Unveiled, Madame Blavatsky summarized the connection between Prometheus, Lucifer, and the Garden of Eden. Quote, the allegory of the fall of man and the fire of Prometheus is also another version of the myth of the rebellion of the proud Lucifer, hurled down to the bottomless pit, Orcus. Defining Prometheus, Madame Blavatsky used the same Christ-like terminology she used to describe Lucifer. Quote, Prometheus, the Greek Lagos. He, who by bringing on earth divine fire, intelligence, and consciousness, endowed men with reason and mind. Prometheus is the Hellenic type of our Kumaras or Egos, those who, by incarnating in men, made of them latent gods instead of animals. The gods, or Elohim, were averse to men becoming as one of us, Genesis 3.22, and knowing good and evil. Hence we see these gods, in every religious legend, punishing man for his desire to know. As the Greek myth has it, for stealing the fire he brought to men from heaven, Prometheus was chained by the order of Zeus to a crag of the Caucasian mountains. Other New Agers and occultists have noted the Luciferian undertones of the Promethean myth. Richard Leviton, for example, states, This light, Lucifer himself, is the essence of our self-awareness, a perception that matches with the Greek concept of the god's unwearying fire bestowed by Prometheus. Metaphysical author Peter Daly likewise states, The Prometheus myth is identifiable with Lucifer and is a myth pertinent to the subject of mind. The name Prometheus means far-seeing. It is synonymous with Lucifer in respect to the introduction of fire derived from the Latin lux and fair, and so therefore light-bearer. Author David Childress concurs, stating, quote, Lucifer is the same god as the Greek Prometheus, the bringer of fire to mankind. For this act, giving man fire, Prometheus was banished from heaven, as was Lucifer. As we will discuss later, the symbol of the Promethean or Luciferian flame was used as a powerful symbol of freedom in the revolutionary movements of the 18th century, which were heavily influenced by occult philosophy, and during which Lady Liberty became the new bearer of the Promethean flame. Many in the New Age claim that Lucifer, like Prometheus, is currently in a state of suffering because humanity as a whole is still unaware of the sacrifice he has made for mankind. Lucifer is unfortunately either demonized as Satan at the hands of Christians, or he is ignored entirely. And it will only be when we have recognized Lucifer for who he truly is that humanity will enter a new age of freedom and power. Lucifer is known as the Lord of Light, the Light Bringer, the Light Bearer. There is the beginning of a glimmer of a new light.
the sun itself uh, is a very important part of uh, raising consciousness on this planet because the energy whether it's radio electronic or magnetic however you want to look at it that is released by the Sun uh, as having a very important effect on the speed at which people change this year more than 8,000 gathered to salute the Sun but I would just say that the Sun is much more than just a star that heats the planet it is linked to the rising of consciousness the solar flares is actually awakening all of us, and we're awakening as one. The sun is very, very much more than it appears to be. It is actually a, a generator of energy, knowledge, information. Oh, glorious sun! Accept our sacrifice, that we may be fruitful once again! mystery religion always followed the light. They always looked toward the east. They considered themselves to be illumined. The worship of the sun is arguably the most prominent and unifying characteristic of nearly all non-biblical religions. And to this day, the sun remains a central object of worship and adoration within the New Age and all other forms of pagan and occult spirituality. In The Secret Doctrine, Blavatsky claimed that, quote, the sun is the giver of life to the whole planetary system, and that, quote, there is a deep philosophy underlying the earliest worship in the world, that of the sun and of fire. And in Isis Unveiled, she referred to, quote, the sun, the preserver and savior. New Age practices like meditation typically involve sun worship of some kind, whether by honoring the sun for its physical light, for its healing powers, or for the potential of its rays to elevate human consciousness. Sun worship is even an integral part of yoga with a few of its gestures and sequences, like the Sura Mudra and sun salutations, which give honor and reverence to the sun. Sun salutations are intended to channel or harness the energy coming from the sun and use it to strengthen and empower one's own body. In her book, Power Yoga, an individualized approach to strength, grace, and inner peace, yoga teacher and trainer Ulrika Norberg discusses the meaning and origins of the sun salutation. Quote, in Sanskrit, sun salutation is called Sura Namaskar, which means graceful, beloved salute to the sun. The sun was central to human life and thought in ancient India. Every morning, the sun was worshipped. The sun was the symbol of the great light and pure insight that people hoped to find in themselves. Traditionally, you closed your eyes just after having seen the morning sun in the hope of finding the same light and strength in yourself. The golden sun was the guiding symbol of the divine. To the Indians, the sun was the god above all gods. The sun generates heat, and yogis claim that if you close your eyes during the sun salutation, your thoughts are guided to the golden ball, creating even more strength and energy. New Age author and researcher Gregory Sams believes that the sun is in fact a conscious living entity deserving of honor and reverence. He deeply respects ancient pagan cultures for their worship of the sun and laments that our modern society has lost its spiritual connection with it, for which he primarily blames Christianity. So your background in a way led you to start thinking about consciousness and oneness and led to the writing of this book. And the book covers so much, but at its foundation is the history of sun worship and why the sun is still so profoundly important today. Um, can you just talk a little bit about why you chose to write about the sun? Well, it's a conscious sun. It's something everybody used to recognize, whatever culture or continent or century you choose. People saw the sun as a living being, and it's the most important thing in our life. I mean, the most important character in our lives is the sun. It is the source of life. Our sun, you see, which is to us a god in that it's our main station of light, um, 
Zoroastrianism recognized the supreme god of light, Ahura Mazda, was the ultimate god. Even the Aztecs, you know, they're you know, known for their sort of slaughter and sacrifices to the sun. The Lord's Prayer for equivalent to Hindus is the Gayatra Mantra, which is a ode to the sun, to the bringer of light and inspiration and, and knowledge to our world. And when we see and if we recognize the sun as a living being, so much else falls into place. According to the Old Testament, God finds sun worship to be among the most abominable of all practices. Most of the major pagan gods mentioned in the Old Testament, such as Baal, Ishtar, and Molech, were associated with the sun. And even though God warned his people against sun and other similar forms of idolatry, it remained a consistent stumbling block for the Israelites. Sun worship is not new. The Bible talks about it as well. Folks, Ezekiel was an Old World Testament prophet and Ezekiel points out that the Lord God considered this practice an abomination. And he tells about how he was taken by God to see a practice occurring near the temple. And starting in verse 12, this is God speaking to Ezekiel and says, Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord has forsaken the earth. He also said unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about twenty and five men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord, and their faces towards the east, and they worship the sun towards the east. Now on the other hand, if you study Solomon's temple, which is what is being discussed there, you will see that the Solomon's temple faced west with its back, as it were, to the east. And here were elders of Israel turning their back on the Ark of the Covenant and facing to worship the rising sun in the east. And the reason why God had his temple built that way is because all around Israel were pagan nations, amen? There were nations that worshiped various pagan gods, Chemosh and, and Baal and all of these other gods. And all of those were what are called solar phallic gods. They were rooted in the sun and in the worship of the male organ. And so God wanted to have something radically different. He wanted his people to have to turn their backs on the sun to worship him. So folks, the God of the Bible has made it perfectly clear that sun worship is something that he does not want. But to show just how far this practice has invaded the Christian community, the following prayer was offered up at a recent funeral in a local Christian church. Quote, Now you will feel no rain, for your mother, the earth, will fold her arms around you. Now you will feel no cold, for your father, the sun, will always warm you." Unquote. Like the Israelites in the Old Testament, Christians throughout history have consistently fallen into sun idolatry, and it has been particularly prominent within the Roman Catholic Church. St. Peter's Square in the Vatican is in fact a giant pagan sundial or sun wheel with an authentic ancient Egyptian obelisk in the center acting as the gnomon which casts a shadow as the sun moves across the sky. In addition, St. Peter's Square depicts both the even-armed cross or the cross of the zodiac which represents the sun and the two equinoxes and two solstices, important seasonal markers in pagan spirituality, as well as the eight-pointed star of Ishtar the supreme light goddess of the Babylonians, who survives today in various forms, such as the Statue of Liberty and the Columbia Pictures logo. The 
worship of the sun has direct correlations with the worship of Lucifer. This is true in many ways. Firstly, the sun as the great and radiant orb of day correlates with Lucifer's identity as the great angel of light, and both have been worshipped in identical ways. Underground filmmaker Kenneth Anger stated on the jacket of his film Lucifer Rising that quote, Lucifer is the light god, not the devil. Lucius Trust declares that Theosophy is, quote, a spiritual tradition which views Lucifer as one of the solar or sun angels, and Blavatsky equated Lucifer with the sun when she stated that Lucifer is, quote, the angelic entity presiding over the light of truth and over the light of day. This leads into another link between Lucifer and the sun. Lucifer is not only identified with physical light, but with spiritual light or inner illumination or enlightenment, a major theme in the New Age. As noted earlier, David Spangler stated that the Luciferic initiation is one in which, quote, we have recognized our inner light, and Blavatsky called Lucifer, quote, the spirit of intellectual enlightenment and the guiding beacon. Richard Levitin claims that Lucifer bears, quote, the light of wisdom, and the founder of the Church of Satan, Anton LaBey, likewise stated in the Satanic Bible that Lucifer is, quote, the personification of enlightenment. In the exact same way, the New Age recognizes the sun not only as the source of physical light, but as a means of gaining more inner, spiritual light. The sun's rays, they believe, help elevate human consciousness, just as Lucifer, the angel of light, bestows wisdom and raises the human to the level of a god. Sun gods throughout history have been honored in the same way. For example, Apollo of Greece, Horus of Egypt, and Hura Mazda of Persia have all, like Lucifer, been recognized as gods of both light and wisdom. Various occultists have recognized this correlation between the sun god and Lucifer. Rudolf Steiner said of Hura Mazda, quote, Ahura Mazda is a Luciferic being who, when we devote ourselves to him, makes us worldless. He wants to tear us loose from heaviness, gravity, and wants us to burn up in the light. New Age author and former leader of the Nazi Party of America, Frank Joseph, says Apollo is, quote, the divine personification of enlightenment. He was revered by some Cathars under his ancient title, the Son of Morning, or Lucifer. And German occult authority Cornelius Agrippa stated in his three books of occult philosophy, quote, The sun is called Apollo, Horus, Osiris. He is also called Architenus, burning fiery, golden flaming, radiating of a fiery hair, of a golden hair, the eye of the world, Lucifer, seeing all things, ruling all things, the creator of light, the king of stars, the great lord, good, fortunate, honest, pure, prudent, intelligent, wise, shining over the whole world. Pure, virtuous, wholesome, innocent individual that's out to help people. Lucifer is? Yeah. Most people do agree in the belief that he is a sun god. And as I was writing this article, Lucifer personally whispered to me and told me when I asked, what was your original identity? I heard it's soul, soul invictus. The word soul literally translates to sun. A third Luciferian aspect of sun worship is its historical connection with the worship of the serpent, which, as we have already discussed, is also a powerful occult symbol of wisdom. In his seminal work, Two Babylons, Scottish minister Alexander Hislop noted this connection between the worship of the serpent and the sun, quote, along with the sun as the great fire god and in due time identified with him was the serpent worshipped. In the mythology of the primitive world, says Owen, the serpent is universally the symbol of the sun. In Egypt, one of the commonest symbols of the sun or sun god is a disc with a serpent around it. The original reason of that identification seems just to have been that, as the sun was the great enlightener of the physical world, so the serpent was held to have been the great enlightener of the spiritual world by giving mankind the knowledge of good and evil. At all events, we have evidence, both scriptural and profane, for the fact that the worship of the serpent began side by side with the worship of fire and the sun. The link between the serpent and the sun or fire is corroborated in Revelation 12, which speaks of a great red dragon, the enemy of God and his church. Commenting on this passage, Hislop states, This formidable enemy of the truth is particularly described in Revelation 12.3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, 
a great red dragon. It is admitted on all hands that this is the first grand enemy that in gospel times assaulted the Christian church. The term dragon, according to the associations currently connected with it, is somewhat apt to mislead the reader by calling to his mind the fabulous dragons of the dark ages equipped with wings. At the time this divine description was given, the term dragon had no such meaning among either profane or sacred writers. The dragon of the Greeks, says Pausanias, was only a large snake, and the context shows that this is the very case here, for what in the third verse is called a dragon in the fourteenth is simply described as a serpent. Then the word rendered red properly means fiery, so the red dragon signifies the fiery serpent or serpent of fire. Blavatsky herself corroborated the connection between the sun and the serpent. Quote, it is very true that the Phoenicians represented the sun under the image of a dragon, but so did all the other people who symbolized their sun gods. This tradition of the dragon and the sun has awakened echoes in the remotest parts of the world and may be accounted for with perfect readiness by the once universal heliolatrous religion. There was a time when Asia, Europe, Africa, and America were covered with the temples sacred to the sun and the dragons. The priests assumed the names of their deities and thus the traditions of these spread like a network all over the globe. Bell and the dragon being uniformly coupled together and the priest of the Ophite religion as uniformly assuming the name of his god. Given the satanic characteristics of sun worship, it should come as no surprise that Satanist Aleister Crowley was enchanted by the sun. The sun god was in fact the main deity of Crowley's religion. Author Nicholas Campion notes the prominence of the Egyptian sun god Horus within Crowley's New Age philosophy. Quote, Crowley's own New Age, which he Hellenized as the New Aeon, was revealed to him in Cairo on 8 through 10 April of 1904 by a superior being, not an ordinary human and so he named his new world the Age of Horus, after the savior and solar deity of ancient Egyptian religion. Crowley himself affirmed his love for the sun, proclaiming in his commentary on the Book of the Law, quote, Our religion, therefore, for the people, is the cult of the sun, from whom, in the strictest scientific sense, come this earth, a chilled spark of him, and all our light and life. And in the life of Aleister Crowley, biographer Richard Kaczynski states that Crowley once affirmed that the beast 666 means, quote, sunlight. 666 is the number of the sun. Simply stated, dear listeners, the sun god that they were praying to is Lucifer. Lucifer, also known as Satan or the devil. sun is linked to the rising of consciousness. 